So thanks, Juan. That was a great segue into this talk. Uh, this is about proof of replication, which is the underlying verifiable storage part of the Filecoin network, and also the way in which Filecoin uses um, storage as a proof of work as well. So decentralized file storage is about taking the massive amount of data that's currently stored in, in centralized data centers and spreading it across the global decentralized web of inter interconnected devices. The idea is that you know the internet has scaled massively. There's billions of interconnected devices, unused storage. Can we leverage those resources to store data in the same way that you would in a centralized storage? Sort of the poster boy success story of peer-to-peer -peer systems um, is BitTorrent, which allowed groups of users to pool together their bandwidth resources to download a file faster, putting less stress on the server. But decentralized file storage takes things to the next level, where you're storing little pieces of data all across the internet, and peer nodes might be storing pieces of data that they aren't even interested in themselves. But they're contributing to a decentralized web of devices that are, that, are, that are housing the storage of the internet. And there's already a, a company working on exactly this, Pied Piper, <laughs> seeing the latest uh, season, Richard Hendricks is decentralizing the web. So we can talk about many advantages of decentralized storage networks. We can talk about censorship resistance, persistent availability, self-monitoring, organic growth, and optimization, disrupting monopolies. But what I want to focus on today are two particular aspects of decentralized storage networks. One is storage cost, and the other is storage trust. So when you're no longer storing your data files in, say, a cloud storage company that you trust, then naturally you have to ask the question, is my data being stored? You may trust the cloud, but do you really store trust peers anywhere across the internet? And it is also at the same time, how do you incentivize data storage? Are people just going to benevolently contribute their nodes, even if they're not using, say, the phones in their pockets to store anything, there's free storage on their phones, how do you incentivize them to actually participate? In BitTorrent, everybody's interested in the same file, but here you might be storing pieces of data that you're not even interested in yourself. So, ideally we want to somehow secure the file storage network in a way that internally ensures that files are still being stored. Even in such a way that if you, after putting your files into the network, you go offline, you go to sleep, you come back the next day, the system is internally ensuring that they will still be there. So there are many flavors of proofs of storage uh, in cryptography. There's <laughs> proofs of data possession, where a server can prove to a, a client that the server actually possesses some data. Proofs of retrievability are a very related concept, which say not only do I possess this data, but I can extract it efficiently. Proofs of space aren't necessarily showing that you're storing particular data, but that you're actually using dedicated storage resources to storing something, whether it's random junk in your hard drive, or actually useful storage, you're proving that you're actually utilizing those resources. And proof of space time is a connected idea which says that you're proving space or dedicating space over a period of time. So what kind of proof of storage would we need for this decentralized file storage network that I've been motivating this problem with? 
So a proof of retrievability might be good enough if all you're going to do is say, use the network to store files and have clients directly pay peers to store their files for them. So a user directly pays for storage and receives a proof of retrievability from another node in the network and in return, say it pays them in Bitcoin or something like that. In fact, proofs of retrievability can be outsourced so that if the client goes offline, somebody else can verify the proof of retrievability for that client. But, as Juan was talking about in, in the previous talk as well, can we somehow subsidize the cost of storage? What if these proofs of retrievability were somehow useful for another purpose as well, that peers in the network could be rewarded for as well? In Bitcoin, you have many, many peers in the network who are contributing proofs of work just computing useless hash, hashes that are being rewarded for it because that proof of work maintains the system and the system relies on it to exist. So it's printing inflation or giving transaction fees as a reward to these peers who are contributing something useful for that particular network. So what if we took the same concept and had a way of, say, having a blockchain that uses these proofs of retrievability <coughs> as its underlying proof of work and so could reward peers in the network for storing other peers' files, thereby subsidizing the cost of actually storing those files for the other peers. The problem is, proofs of retrievability alone really would not be at all a good proof of work. The problem is that Retrievability just means that you can retrieve some data. If you know the data yourself, you could generate just say a large amount of junk data on the fly from some small C. You store, store that small C, and then you can prove that, okay, look, I can retrieve a gigabyte of data, but that data just might be random junk. So it's not a it's not a restricting resource, and it's not useful for a proof of work for a blockchain. What you really need here is a proof of space, a proof that you're actually using storage resources as your work. The problem is we can't just use a proof of space and a proof of retrievability separately. Well, what would happen if we, say, dedicated one disk to giving a proof of space to the blockchain, and then the blockchain would also check that we're also producing some proof of retrievability. When we want to produce a retrievability for another peer on the network, we have to use a separate disk to store their file. It would be much cheaper, it would be less costly if I don't actually store anybody's data. I use my disk space to do proofs of space for the network, and then if the blockchain wants to see that I'm able to retrieve some data, well then I'll just store junk data that I can generate easily and I don't need a lot of storage to store. So it's really important that we can double use the same storage that we're using for storing useful things, storing other people's files, to also be able to prove that we're using storage to the blockchain. Otherwise, there would actually be an even higher cost for storing actual users' files. People would have to pay you to use your storage to store their files and also cover the opportunity cost that you have of just using that extra disk space to produce a proof of space for the blockchain. Think about in Bitcoin when you're, when you're using your computational power to do hashes for proofs of work. Somebody now, if somebody wants to hire you to do some computation for them, then they have to now cover your opportunity cost of using that electricity to actually produce proofs of, of work for Bitcoin. So the whole concept here is to be able to double use the same resources to do a proof of work for the blockchain and also to do something useful for someone else. So what we want is a proof that you're dedicating unique resources to storing a replica of the data 
even if you can generate all that data from, say, a small seed. This way, there's no, there shouldn't be any additional cost to storing real data, nor a preference for compressible or duplicated data over unique data, or over the cost of simply producing a proof of space. As a special case, this would give you a way to prove that you're dedicating unique resources to storing n different replicas of the same file, even if you know the file contents. Here, if you know one copy of the file, then you can easily generate n copies of the file. But now, with a proof of this kind, I'm demonstrating that I'm actually using n times the amount of storage to store n different unique replicas of the same file. And that's where we get the name proof of replication. So, from a cryptographic defin definitional perspective, a proof of replication is going to involve three main algorithmic components. There's a proof of replication set up, which generates some replica from an input data file. There will be a, a proof that takes in some challenge from a verifier and outputs a proof of storage. It proves that this replica is actually being stored. And then there will be a, some kind of verification algorithm that the verifier can run on that proof and either accept it or reject it. From a protocol perspective, the way a proof of replication interactive protocol will work, will work is that here there's a time axis. There's some setup period that takes a long time where the prover generates a replica of the data being stored. And then there's an online challenge phase where the verifier will send challenges to the prover to see if that prover is actually storing the replica as claimed. And we want the property that an attacker, say, who's not actually storing the replica would fail to respond to these challenges in time or would simply fail the challenges completely. Put another way, in terms of a cryptographic game, there's some adversary who's saying, trying to be a prover in, say, the Filecoin network, giving a proof of replication. That adversary will have the opportunity during the setup phase to generate a replica, and then we'll have to respond to challenges in the online phase, and it will need to respond to these challenges within some kind of time window in a way that convinces the challenger that he's actually storing a replica of the file. If this adversary succeeds in this game, then there are several properties that we want to come out of it. We want to say that any adversary who's able to succeed in convincing the challenger to accept the proof must be able to extract the original data from whatever it's storing. We also want a guarantee of space. We want to say that if an adversary is able to pass this challenge, then if we looked at any snapshot of the adversary's state during that challenge period, not just the amount, not just the state at the beginning or at the end, but any snapshot of the adversary state during this entire challenge period, it would have a certain size. The adversary would have to be using almost as much space as is needed to store the entire file. We also want the property that if you produce two independent proofs of replication, then they can't be storing, they can't be sharing the same resources. You would have, to, you would guarantee that they're, you're using two times as much space, even if you're proving two independent proofs of replication of the same file. And finally, and this is sort of the hardest, this is sort of the hardest property to conceptualize. We want the proof of replication to guarantee a unique replication. 
We want it to be the case that if you're, if you're using your resources, you're using space to produce a proof of replication of a particular file, then you can't embed other useful data into that space instead. If you think back to the motivation, it shouldn't matter if I'm producing a proof of replication of compressible data or non-compressible data, of data that I can generate from small c, or useful data from another party. We want it to be the case that it's the same cost in all those scenarios. If I'm claiming that I'm storing a file of a fixed size, say n bits, then no matter what kind of underlying data I'm using the space to do a proof of replication for, I shouldn't be able to compress down part of that data, say not actually store the useful data that someone else has because I know another copy of it is sitting somewhere else, and instead use my space to do something else. That's exactly what would lend the network to increase cost of storage. The problem is that you can't really guarantee in the strongest sense that I'm actually storing the specific bits of the replica that I claim to be storing. For example, I could take my state, I could encrypt it under a key, and then I could store the key plus the state. To me, this means the same thing, because when I get challenged online, I can just use the key to decrypt my space, my state, and pass the proof of replication as I would before. But this isn't a strategy that actually compresses the size of my replica or allows me to use that space for any other useful task. So we wanted to capture this incompressibility of a replica that intuitively, even if I'm doing some other strategy that's not storing the specific bits of this replica, I cannot use this space to encode any other useful data. So that brings us to a rational adversary definition of security, which is very common in this space and, and very common in um, cryptographic proofs of, proofs of space as well. And this is roughly saying that the adversary, it doesn't cost the adversary anything extra to just store the files that they're claiming to store. A good strategy satisfies this strong replication notion that they're actually storing the bits of the file that they claim to be storing. And for any other adversarial strategy, there would be an efficient way to just switch to being a good adversary. Now, in addition we, to security goals, we want to have efficiency goals, like scalability, which should scale the large files. We want to have low communication. We want the proofs uh, to be compact. We don't want the adversary to, to, or the prover to just have to be sending the entire file to the verifier. And we want fast verification. So let me give you the basic idea behind a proof of replication. The main tool would be to use a verifiable time delay encoding. At a very informal, intuitive description, this is an encoding that takes a long amount of time to generate. Time in terms of wall clock time, not computational effort, but specifically wall clock time. It's a sequentially slow encoding. And on the other hand, it's fast to decode. A bad example of this would be iterating an encryption many times. And that, now that would be slow and slow encoding, and it would be decodable, but it wouldn't be faster to decode than to encode. There are better examples, though, uh, from cryptography. Um, they've been these have been referred to recently in, in a paper by myself and some co-authors on as verifiable delay functions but I'm not going to go into that in any more detail here. So the idea behind a basic proof of replication would be for the prover to take a long time to generate the slow encoding of the underlying data file, and then in the challenge phase, the verifier would ask for that encoding, and the server wouldn't be able to respond quickly enough if the server deleted the entire replica. Now, this would not be communication efficient, which is why this is, again, just sort of a straw man example of what a proof of replication would be. Maybe this would work for small files, but here the prover has to send the entire file over to the verifier. 
So, what about larger files? Well, one thing that we can do is just break up the file into blocks and encode each of them separately using the same strategy on each independent block. And then what the verifier can do is just query for some randomly sampled number of these blocks. And that would be enough if it checked that all of these randomly sampled blocks were generated correctly. It would be enough to gain confidence that, say, 90% of the blocks are being stored. And we can amplify that confidence uh, to 100% if we were to use erasure coding. But the problem is that this becomes very expensive for the prover to do. Each of these encodings needs to take a long period of time, which is what guarantees that in the online phase it won't be able to do it again if it deleted the, the encoding. And now it has to do it, say, times a billion if it's storing now a billion blocks. So would there be a way to sort of chain the encoding so that the overall encoding takes the same amount of time. So the first idea would be to do some kind of cipher block chaining encoding. Or say, for example, you could derive the encoding of the first block, then XOR that with the next block, derive an encoding of that, and so on and so forth. This is just like CBC mode encryption. And then you could adjust the delay cost of each encoding so that the total time takes the same. But the problem is, on the one hand, this is good for verification because to check that any individual block was encoded correctly, we just need the previous block and we can quickly decode it to check that it's correct. This also leads to an attack where the prover now, after generating the entire encoding, on the online phase, deletes half of the blocks, and then when challenged for a particular block, can just figure out what the encoding it is from the previous block that it is still storing. And you can do this for any of the other half of the blocks that are challenged. So, what we do is in this work, which I'm not going to go into in any more detail because I'm out of time, but what we do is we use some form of depth robust chaining so that the adversary can't do this thing where he deletes part of the blocks. Because if the adversary were to delete, say, too many blocks, there would be some chain reaction of dependencies among those deleted blocks, and it would still have to derive many of the blocks that it deleted in a sequential way so that it would still have to take a long amount of time in the online phase. There's two types of graphs that we will be using for this, one of them is called a depth robust graph. Another possibility is, is to use these hard to pebble graphs which don't guarantee the sequentiality but still guarantee that the prover has to expend a lot of work in order to re-derive data that it's deleted when challenged. So, in summary, we plug this encoding into the protocol that I described before where you're deriving the slow encoding chained across all the blocks of the file in some depth-robust way. And then the verifier would just query for some constant number of the blocks, check individually that they were derived correctly, and gain confidence that you must have been storing nearly all the blocks of the file in this encoded way. So in summary, we've designed uh, proof of replication secure under a rational adversarial model where there's no added cost to above producing a proof of space to storing other people's files in a useful way. It has a feasible and scalable setup even as the file grows to billions of blocks. Low communication and fast and low complexity verification. Thank you.